for joining our session about student visa. Uh, we will start in a few minutes. Um, hi, Praveen. Hi, Chloe. How are you? Great, Asil. Thank you. Great. Hi, Asil. Hi, hi Praveen. Hi, how are you doing? Great, great. So, are you are you ready to start? I am ready. I am ready to share my screen. Great. Okay, let's kick it off. Okay. Thank you for joining. Hello, everyone. So we have one of our wonderful consular officers, Chloe. She is going to talk to you about the student visa which is uh, one of the steps that you need to take care of when you do uh, your study in the States, or if you are thinking of uh, pursuing your study in the States. Okay, Great. let's begin. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's student visa info session. My name is Chloe and I am a consular officer at the U.S. Embassy in Doha. I'm here to talk to you about the process for applying for a student visa. First, please note that the U.S. Embassy in Doha has resumed online scheduling for all non-immigrant visa categories, including student visas. The U.S. Embassy has a lot of availability for interviews and welcomes all bona fide students to apply for a visa. Now let's begin with discussing the student visa application process. There are more than 4,000 higher education institutions in the US. Students studying in the US can apply for our F or M visa. Each student must be enrolled in the Student and Exchange Visitor Program, SEBP, and must pay their service fee before obtaining a visa. Please visit www ICE.gov slash SEVIS for more information. After you have been admitted to a program in the US, you can apply for a visa interview at the US Embassy. You are encouraged to apply for your non immigrant student visa as soon as you have your I 20. To ensure you get an early and timely date, you may apply at any time. When you attend your interview, you must bring the following documents with you. First, the I-20 from the university with a valid start date. Second, the receipt that you paid the service fee. And third, proof of how you will fund your first year of your education. The form I-20 is an official US government form issued by a certified school, which prospective non-immigrant student must have in order to get an F-1 or M-1 visa. Form I-20 acts as proof of acceptance and contains the information necessary to pay the service fee. Apply for a visa or change visa status and be admitted into the US. Now, the proof of how you will fund your first year of education could include bank statements, a salary certificate from yourself or a parent, or proof of tuition payments that you or your family have already paid. Now, when can you apply for a visa? Students may start applying 120 days before the start of your program. However, a student visa may be issued no more than 120 days prior to the start date mentioned on your I-20. Make sure all the information on the visa application is accurate. Your photo must be less than three months old and you may enter the United States 30 days before the start of your program. Note, parents and family members, if you're traveling with your student to the US, you may be able to accompany your student on a B1, B2 tourist visa. However, your stay is generally restricted to six months and you would need to apply for an extension with the Immigration Service USCIS in the United States if you wish to stay longer. For more information and to book an appointment, please visit www.ustraveldocs.com slash QA. To begin your educational journey, please contact Education USA and the US Embassy about discovering educational programs in the US. 
You can email doha at educationusa.org for more information and to schedule an initial consultation with one of Education USA's advisors. Thank you for attending today's session. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for this brief overview. So for students who are joining us now, uh, feel free to share your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself to ask questions. And in the meantime, so there are some frequent questions that we keep getting uh, all the time. Like one of them, Chloe, is because you've mentioned that they can be in the States 30 days before the start of their study uh, period, let's say, of time. The question is, can they stay, can they be there before that time? Like for some students, they might ask this question and we get it all the time. Can I be in the States like and get to explore before I start my own courses and study? So what's your advice to these students? That's a great question. If you already have or would like to have a B1, B2 tourist visa, you can travel to the US on that visa before starting your program for those 30 days. Note, when you do start your program, you need to alert the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services about adjusting your status in the US so that they know that you've begun your program. So yes, you're welcome to travel to the US 30 days before if you have a B1, B2 tourist visa. Thank you so much. Also, we got this other question very frequently, which is if a student stays in the States and like they needed to extend their stay after their, because like they got something and they had to extend their time of stay or their, their, their study and all of these. So any reason for them to stay beyond the end of their time on their I-20. So what do they need to do? Yeah, so many students complete months or a year after the program called OPT. It is a work program that can be affiliated with their school that allows them to stay in the U.S. longer. So if you're staying in the U.S. longer than your F1 allows, it needs to be, there needs to be an extension to allow you to be affiliated with that school. Otherwise, you would have to leave and then come back on a different type of visa. So if you want to extend your visa or apply for the OPT program, please visit www.uscis.gov, or you can learn more about it through the SEVIS program because that's the program that also handles the OPT. Great, thank you so much. We have one of our participants today the question, we have a question from them. So are the visa application and interview slots available considering the COVID restrictions? So at this moment, all appointments are available for students as well as those who are applying for any other type of visa in the US. So you can go online to our website, uh, the US Embassy's website, click on visas and make an appointment today. And we have been processing applications and we will make it a priority regarding students to continue processing applications. As you know, Qatar has seen an increase in COVID cases and we are doing our best inside the waiting room to keep it safe and to keep people socially distanced. If we do decrease our services, we will let you know on our website, on our social media, but at this moment, services are still open. Great, thank you so much. Any other question from our participants? So there are also some other questions that we get very frequently, like are there specific restrictions on certain nationalities since we live in a country that has huge number of expats? So, if people live here and they are not citizens, can they apply through the, I mean, for a student visa or visa or not? That's a great question. Actually, most of our student population we interview at the U.S. Embassy are non cuttery citizens. So we want to see that you're a bona fide student. At this point, there are no restrictions about which nationalities can apply for a visa or not. 
um, the presidential proclamations that prohibited certain groups of individuals from traveling to the US have been lifted and revoked. So I would say go ahead and apply. You just need to demonstrate that you're a bona fide student and that you want to study in the US and that you plan to use your program for a future career. Note that the presidential proclamations about regional restrictions still exist. That means if you've been in the Schengen zone, uh, the UK, Ireland, China, Brazil, or South Africa, less than 14 days before your trip to the US, you may not be allowed to enter. So you need to be sure that you are traveling from a country that is not prohibited on allowing entry into the US. Thank you so much. So for students, sometimes they are in a hurry and they don't like plan uh, like ahead of time. So they don't keep in mind that they need some time to uh, do the visa application. So what's your advice to them? How much in advance they should be prepared to do the visa application and how much does it take to do the process, the, the visa processing? Yes, so visa issuance can take anywhere between two to four days at the U.S. Embassy, but we highly encourage that once you, as a student, receive your I-20 form, you make an appointment with the U.S. Embassy. Now, you can't be issued a visa more than 120 days before um, your entry and your start of your program, but go ahead and make the appointment and show that you're a qualified student, and then once those 120 days comes nearer, then we can issue you the visa. But try to apply as early as possible because you don't want to have to wait or if there is something called administrative processing that withholds you from attending your program on time. Thank you so much. This is really a great piece of, of advice because lots of students, they just do it at the last minute and they don't have enough time. Thank you. Yep. So another question is, where are the financial records? What are the financial records required? to apply for the visa if one wishes to pursue graduate studies? It's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. There are no set financial records that are required to apply for an F or M visa if you're doing graduate studies or undergraduate. You need to show that you are willing and able to pay for the program though, at least for that first year. That means you could show a bank statement or a savings account that shows you have sufficient money to cover your first year. It could mean that you've already paid a couple of tuition payments and have a rolling income that allows you to pay the rest and you demonstrate that. It could also be a salary certificate from a parent. It could be from yourself that shows you'll continue to work or someone will continue to work to be able to pay for your education and tuition in the US. So you just need to demonstrate that there's no set exact paper or form you need, but you need to show a uh, income or assets, financial assets in order to pay for your education in the US. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions from our participants? Anything that you're interested about? Anything you would like to know about the visa, visa processing? There looks like any other frequent questions that you receive, Chloe. Sorry. Yeah, no, please go. I was going to read the question. Question is if the financial documents are from the home country and I am appearing for a visa interview from Doha in Doha, will mm -hmm. that be a problem? So no. Um, of course, we can look at a current currency converter, whether it's in your home country, whether it is in Doha bank account or even a bank account in the US, you need to be able to provide a variable uh, supplement of payment, variable proof of payment, no matter what currency it is in. And that, that money and that account is accessible and able to pay for the income. So no, that's not a problem. I've seen that before. Thank you so much. In fact, uh, also another frequent question that we always get in the comments and um, from different like from different nationalities like students who live in other countries so they always ask us uh when we do our webinars and we stream them live on our facebook page they always ask like how can i get to doha in order to apply for a student visa so the issue is that we can't control this because this is something related to the government of qatar so if you have anything to add chloe we really appreciate it yes so unfortunately 
the pandemic has caused many countries to close their borders and likewise many U.S. embassies have stopped providing as many services in many countries around the world, especially in the Middle East. Uh, Doha, Qatar is um, the embassy here is one of those posts that is open for all visa types. So we have received a lot of questions. And while we would like to help as many people as possible, we can't help you with getting to Doha. And at the moment, the immigration uh, procedures are one, you need to be have a visa, that's a work visa, or you need to be a resident permit holder or a GCC citizen in order to be able to travel to Doha. If you are not one of those, you are not able to enter Doha at this time. And I would check with the Ministry of Interior's website about when they will lift those restrictions. So if you are in Qatar at the time or have a work visa or you have a residency permit, you are welcome to come to Doha, interview for a visa, and your visa will be processed as normal, but we cannot help those students that are currently outside. You will have to try to seek another post, another U.S. Embassy that is open and willing to uh, take your case or you're willing to travel there to interview or you will have to wait for the U.S. Embassy in your country to reopen for student visas. Thank you so much. So we have three questions from all, one of our participants. The first one is, so uh, I'm a Pakistani citizen working in Qatar and will be leaving my job in June 2021 to start my master's in the States in fall 2021. Should I apply for a student visa in Islamabad or Doha? That's a great so, question. Yes, so you can apply at either post. Like I said, um, if that country Pakistan, Islamabad particularly is open for student visas. So you can apply there. If you're in Doha, you can apply here. So it's up to you, the choice. Just know that if there is additional processing that um, is required, you may have to wait a little bit longer in the other country in order to um, get your visa. So it's up to you. Thank you so much. The second question is part of my master's funding is through a student loan from a third part, party lender in the States. Does that affect my eligibility for a student visa? So we need to see proof of how you're going to pay for the visa that include financial aid, which includes a uh, amalgamation of loans, grants, scholarships, it, it can include uh, private funding from a third party or from a foundation or your family. So it's not about where the funding should come from. We just need to see that an entity, whether it be yourself, a third party is able to pay for the money. So at this moment, that's that sounds fine. Just apply for your visa and we will look at your documents and hear your case at the interview. Thank you so much. Um, so with regard to third question, so uh, I own a business in Pakistan and would be involved with managing that business while being a master's student in the States. I will not be doing like daily operations for that, but bookkeeping, managing contracts with suppliers would still be my responsibility. So is this legal? That is like, a fantastic yeah. question. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. While you're a student, you cannot work in the United States unless you're offered a work study program while you're in school. That includes you and any derivatives like a spouse or children as well. You are not able to work in the US outside of university jobs or whatever the university has given you the permission to work. So working outside the US, there is no problem for that, but you should note that if you have a business or another entity or something outside the US that could interact, distract or take away from your studies and that you don't complete your studies, you could be in violation of your visa and your program in the US. So that's just something to consider as well. Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, I hope that we, you get clear, that, like everything is clear for you, Hamza. And if you have any other questions, feel free to share them through the chat box. Great, thank you.
okay, one more question, just share it because we are going to share the other question because I got a question through private messaging. Okay, how long approximately does the visa process take? Although you answered this somehow, but uh, also does it differ based on the factors like nationality, reason for application, et cetera? That's a great question. So we look at each student individually, regardless of the nationality. Now there are some nationalities where they have to pay more for their student visa. It's called a reciprocity fee. What your country charges for student visas, the US charges you for student visas. And there are some students who require additional processing called administrative processing. That's just where we just have to do a little bit more research on your case. That can sometimes take a week or two weeks which is why we encourage students to apply as early as possible because they will not know if they need administrative processing or not until they interview. So normally our visa turnaround at the moment, if you don't need additional processing, is about two to four days. If you need additional processing, it could be anywhere from a week or more. Also, when you come for your interview, we just want to recommend to be sure you're completely documentarily complete. That means you have your I-20 form presented with a future start date. It's signed. You've shown or brought some proof of how you're going to pay for your program. You brought proof that you are um, you have paid your service fee and any proof that you're a bona fide student as well. So the more documentarily ready you are at the interview, the less back office and uh, issues there will be in the pending status in the administrative part of issuing a visa. Great. The other question that we have from Hamza is, can I do paid freelance work for a client outside of the US while being based in the US as a graduate student or master's student? As I understand, if you're not on a work visa in the US and you are on a student visa, you cannot work unless it is affiliated or permitted by the university. So I'd be really careful about that, Hamza, if you're going to work in the US because you don't want to be in violation of your program. So I would say no at this point, but I would look at the regulations at USCIS, uh, that agency, as well as the SEPAS program about what's allowed. Thank you so much. The other question that we have, how can a student show he is bonafide or not? A bona fide student means a student that is qualified to do the program, to pursue the program in the US. That means you have completed the educational and academic requirements to be admitted into the university and show that you will succeed in the program. If it's a specific training program or requires specific skills, especially if it's a graduate program, you will need to show that you've completed the necessary pre-graduate requirements to complete that program. There's no set way to show. Um, usually some programs require English, most of them do. It's good to show that you have a good level of English. And you should also know about your school. Why did you choose that school? Tell me about the school. What are you looking most forward to? What are you going to study? Um, that's kind of along the lines of where I can tell or my fellow consular officers can tell you're a bona fide student. Great. So you need to come prepared and you should be knowledgeable about your program before you you attend your, your, your appointment and you get to the embassy. Also, some something that, in fact, um, I noticed like for one of the students, in fact, some some applicants, they might be applying for a very short type of training in the States and they are not familiar with what they need to bring with them, what they need to apply. So can you please just provide uh, like um, something about what they need to do, what they need to pay as well. So most F programs are for two-year associate's degrees or for four-year schools or for two-year or postgraduate education, two-year or more. There are some M programs and F programs that are shorter. You can also do a range of educational programs on a B1, B2 visa, but most of the time you'll be issued an F or an M visa. Likewise, you still need to show you have an I-20, you've paid your service fee, and that if the program does cost money, you need to show proof of payment or how you're going to pay for that program. So likewise, the same documents. And why this program? Why are you choosing this program? How is it going to help you in your future? 
Thank you so much. Another question that I had through the private chat. So uh, if I if I apply for visa now, after I have an I-20, will I have my interview in the nearest available slot or within 120 days before the program start date? Uh, so visa appointments are open. You can choose when you want to have your appointment. We do not have an, a huge backlog of when people can get appointments. And if you email us, you can also, we will prioritize an appointment for students to make sure that you get to your program on time. But please check out the website first before um, emailing us because there are lots of appointments available. And even if there is potential lockdown, we want to help students get to the U.S. to their programs on time. Thank you. Uh, so the other question. So you're welcome, Hamza. Hamza says thank you for answering all of his questions. The other question is, so if the school they applied to didn't require TOEFL, how can they prove, prove their proficiency? The students, yep. Another great question. Not every school in the US requires English proficiency. Most do, but not every school. And some individuals actually are going to the US to learn English. So if it's a requirement, we will test your requirement just through the interview. Um, or you need to show proof that you've met that requirement as well. If it's not a requirement, then it's not a requirement and we will not test you or be concerned about that requirement. Great. The other question that we have is about English programs. If a student wants to study an English program, so just these intensive programs or uh, pathway programs, is it likely that his visa can be approved? Sounds like devil's advocate. I can't tell you from today or tomorrow or on this call whether a visa will be approved or not without interviewing the applicant, seeing the necessary documents, knowing if the student was a bona fide student. It's not about which program is more likely you'll be approved for. It's can you demonstrate why you chose this program and if how you're going to pay for it and if you're a bona fide student and how this program will help you. So there's no set program that allows a visa to be more approvable than others. Okay. The other question that we have is are all programs for masters on campus in the States or does it depend on the university or program? So as far as we know, in fact, so it depends on the university. Some of them are going like all virtual and others are doing the hybrid, which is a, a blend of both virtual and in-person and others are, are planning to do it in person. Please feel free to chime in clearly about this question. Exactly, uh, some programs are uh, completely different and they don't require you to attend classes every single day. Some do weekends, some do a short period of time, some are international where they take you to multiple countries. There's been a whole range of different types of programs in the US and what they've been doing during the pandemic, hybrid, uh, in-person, virtual. Some require now their students to be vaccinated, some are requiring COVID tests. It, some require you not to be on campus, some require you to be on campus. So it's, you really just have to research what is required for that individual school and that program. Great, thank you. So the other question that we have, if a student has a B1, B2 visa, which is approved and they apply or he or she applies for an F visa and it gets approved. So does the B1, B2, or is it still valid till the expiration date or what happens? So we do not cancel other visas unless it is the same type of visa to issue new visas. So you can have a B1, B2 visa and an F1 visa because you are eligible for both. One, you're going to the US on tourism, the other one you're using to study in the US. The most important thing to remember though, is that if you are going to adjust status in the US, from a B1, B2 or an F1 to a B1, B2, you need to notify the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and your SEVP, Student Exchange Visitor Program, because they will need to notify immigration 
that your adjusting status are changing. Otherwise, you'll be in a violation of your program. And in fact, this question and the answer would be really useful for those students who are willing to go to the States to explore and to get to know more before they start their own program. Thank you so much. The other questions that we have. So we have a participant from Nepal. I would like to know that if we don't have scholarship in our I-20 for graduate degree, just like STEM, is there any chance of visa being refused by the visa consular officer, even though we as international students have three intentions, genuine full student can pay for the study, leave the US to their home country after graduation. So, like, sorry, it's a bit long. Yeah, no, like <laughs> other questions I cannot adjudicate here uh, and during this video, I would have to interview the applicant like my colleagues. And if one officer refuses you, you can always interview with another officer and they will look at the totality of your circumstances. So yeah, I would just recommend applying whether you're here in Qatar or you're in Nepal and seeing what the decision is. Just be sure to be documentarily ready and show you're a bona fide student and you're able to pay for your program. And in fact, this uh, reminded me of a question that also um, some students are interested in, which is like, because you've mentioned that they have to prove that they have the funding for their own study. So some students might might have this question. So does do they have to provide proof for the four year or the two year? I mean, the whole duration of the program or just the first year? So we're looking at just the first year. Now, it, of course, if you're not able to pay for your program, your program will cease allowing you to take the program. So that is why we're looking at just the first year, but the visas for these programs are valid for the totality of the programs. So that is why we're just looking at the first year. Thank you. So the other question is, if someone is working with the Mideast and got admitted uh, to a graduate program, that he or she applied for before getting to work. So is it likely that their visa would be disapproved? Okay, thank you, Ilham. You'll have to tell me a little bit more. Are you working with the Mideast in the Middle East? Are you working with the Mideast based out of the US? You have to tell me, do you already have a work visa? Where are you based? Because I can't fully answer that question. Ilham, feel free to unmute yourself or share more information in the chat box if you are more comfortable doing that. So he or she works in the Middle East. So they applied for graduate study and then they got employed by a Middle East in the Middle East. So. So I think we're confusing acceptance into a program with visa approvability a bit. Is that, uh, and you got admitted into a graduate program probably because you worked with the Mideast as an experience. I'm sure that helped, but that doesn't have anything to do with getting approved for a visa. We look at who's eligible for a visa based, for a student visa particularly, based off one, you're a bona fide student, um, so that doesn't necessarily tie into your work. It's about have you done the requirements to get to this, be admitted into this program and to, to succeed in the program. Two, you're able to pay for the program. And three, knowing that this program will help you succeed in the future. So um, I can't tell you whether the visa will get approved or disapproved, but we aren't necessarily so concerned about where you worked, I think that was more important for the admission into the, the graduate program probably. So maybe, I think Ilham, so Ilham, correct me if I'm wrong. So are you talking about conflict of interest? Because that is something different. Because like it happens that sometimes like if, if someone works for a Mid East or any other institution that run some exchange programs and they apply for those exchange programs, they might be some type. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is what she meant because, oh, okay. yeah, this is a familiar question. So yeah, so because because when they get accepted or admitted into that program, it was before joining 
the institution which has this conflict restriction. So what do you think about this? She's thinking of the conflict of interest. I do not have an answer for you, Elham, today, but if you email us, um, hopefully we can do some, our research and find an answer for you. I, it's my first time hearing about that working for a program, having a conflict of interest. So I will write our email address in the chat box and feel free to send us an email about this. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ilham. Any other last question? Because, uh, so this question is, since US Embassy in Nepal is closed for F1 visa interview uncertain time, how we as international students could be optimistic regarding having an appointment for F1 visa interview who had applied for those who applied for fall 2021. So they, they applied, maybe they get admitted, but still they don't have any visa interviews at the, at the embassy. Thank you so much, Raj, for that question. And I'm so sorry about your situation, especially being in Nepal. Uh, Qatar was in a situation like this last year where we weren't able to approve many student visas and some students missed their program or they started classes online. Uh, we're in a different situation now at the moment, but what I would recommend is reach out to the U.S. Embassy in Nepal. If you already have done that, you can consider traveling to another post that has a U.S. Embassy and applying for your student visa there. Otherwise, you may have to wait until the U.S. Embassy in Nepal reopens and then you can join your program then or you can start classes online depending on the program you have been admitted into. So those are just a couple of options, but I, I wish we could help you more. But because of the pandemic, it has made many students un unable to start their programs. Thank you so much, Chloe, for your help to demystify certain ideas that are certain like issues with regard to the visa and help clarify things and answer any questions. Thanks a lot. And thanks for everyone who joined us today. Please um, note that uh, you need to make use the best use of your time. Go and visit as many booths as, as you would like. There are testing organizations as well. So if you are interested in TOEFL, ILETS, SAT, ACT, you can visit these universities and also you can talk to the US embassy staff about their own exchange programs. And there is also, there would be a visa officer also in the US embassy booth, but later in the day. Also, you can talk to our booth, Education USA Qatar, if you need any help. If you have difficulty with the language also, there are bilingual speakers in our help desk. Thank you so much for joining us and wishing you all the best. Thanks a lot, Chloe. Thanks, Pavian. Take care, everyone. Thanks.